Hi, this is Professor Cummings, and what you have in front of you here is what's known as an Ishikawa diagram. You also heard it called a, a cause and effect diagram, a fishbone diagram, and probably a few other names I can't think of, but basically it's a diagram that is used as a problem solving tool. And what I was going to do today is give you a, a brief presentation over how to use a, an Ishikawa diagram and also why to use an Ishikawa diagram and once you've used it what exactly do you do with the information so let's get started so exactly what is an Ishikawa diagram well an Ishikawa diagram is a tool that came about actually during the 1960s so a relatively recent tool it was developed by this engineer named, named Ishikawa it's a problem solving tool that's based on a well established problem statement so you have to establish the problem statement first that you're going to work with so a well established problem statement and breaking that problem into possible causes with finite a finite number of categories and hence the name cause and effect diagram because what you have is essentially a, a cause or a series of possible causes and an effect. So you got an effect and, and its and its causes over here on the on the left side of the diagram. Now you notice that here we have these different categories that we've broken it up into. These aren't set in stone. These are just typical uh, categories, particularly in a manufacturing in set, uh, environment. You know they usually break it up into manpower, manpower the actual machine or sometimes they call it equipment the material that you're using the method that you're using and the environment that you're uh, doing it in and sometimes they have another category known as measurement meaning your your gauging tools your quality tools are also part of the cause and effect that can lead you to a particular problem so this is basically what it what a Ishikawa diagram is but what are the benefits of using an Ishikawa diagram well for one they're highly visual so the problem as well as any possible causes are laid out right in front of you. You know, they're they're easy to see, they're open to discussion, and they can also and they can be weighed out, you know, almost in an instant. It's a very systematic approach. Because you've got it broken up into bit, uh different categories, you're not going to waste a lot of your time just trying to track down different ways to make this thing work or different ways of trying to to find what could be another category you've got it broken up as people come up with new ideas new possible causes they know which category they can fit it under it's very organized you know there's no reason to go back and forth or bounce around and if you happen to you know you can get back on track very easily so it's a very organized method of of solving a problem which is one of the biggest problems the biggest problems in problem solving is being systematic and well organized in your approach and then last that I got listed here is it provides a method to establish a problem and drive towards a root cause so it's actually a, a like I said, systematic and a way to actually establish that problem and then gives you some sort of method to actually approach solving that problem. So what you would do when you set up your Mishikawa diagram, you typically do this with a cross-reference team, a, a group of people of different skills, different perspectives to help you go through this process because at its core this is still a brainstorming session. It just happens to be a very visual, very organized, very systematic brainstorming session, but it's a brainstorming session nonetheless. And so you get some value from people from all aspects of the organization, all different areas of the organization that might provide you with insight that you otherwise wouldn't have. Not only that, but in the bigger organizations, a lot of these different categories could be people's specialty. You know, you might need a, someone with a, a supervision background, somebody with an environmental background, a facilities background, somebody who is, you know, a manufacturing engineer who understands the methods and the machines, and somebody who's got a metallurgical background or some sort of materials or chemical background that might understand the materials or the, the actual inputs into the system. So, you know, again, so you've got a group of people. Typically, it's a group of people, not necessarily, but a typically a group of people that have a very systematic, very visual, very organized approach to problem solving.
Okay, so how will we go about doing this? How will we go about actually utilizing this Ishikawa diagram? Well, first thing you have to do is establish the problem. You know, and that is the head of the fish head on the on the diagram, on the fishbone diagram. So you would actually take the time to establish the problem, write it out clearly, understand have everyone in the group understand what the problem statement is. And from that point, you can start to move forward. If you can't establish the problem, and this is true not just in Ishikawa diagrams, but any number of problem solving techniques that you'll look at, establishing the problem is the first thing you have to do. And if you can't do that, then you can't really solve the problem. So the first thing you can do is, is solve the problem. The next thing you have to do, you have to actually establish what the the categories are going to be. Now in this one, and it's a very generic method, is the man-machine method environment material. Like I said, that is very typical in manufacturing and production environments. Some groups might have, you know, if it's a, a an accounting organization, you may have money. You know, if it's, you know, a medical organization, you might have some sort of, uh, I think, implying, you know, expiration dates or drugs or some other issue that might cause you to to, the, to have a, you know some concern you know a category you might fit things under but these are the most generic if as you approach or use this technique you don't necessarily have to limit yourself to these five or, and if you use measurement that one method of of categories you can actually set up the categories based on what would logically fit your organization next you go into the brainstorming session or deeper into the brainstorming session and in this session you're actually or in this point you're actually writing the category under the categories what the potential causes are that fall under that particular category you know so once you've started you know set it up you can look at the methods and you start looking at things that have to do with the method that is in your organization that could have possibly led to that problem and can remember it's a brainstorming session so you know there's going to be a lot of ideas coming out now one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to let this fishbone diagram get too out of control you know because like i said it's a visual process but it can actually backfire because as you have one problem that comes up you might actually have a second or one potential cause come up you might actually have other branches off of this that can also lead to different reasons so you might have some issue with the machine you say well one possible cause could be x and then you realize well there's several other reasons that could lead to x which also can go to the problem so it can break down and keep bringing out a more and more granular um, uh, degree as you go through this problem and then last you want to start investigating the causes so it's not enough that you just had a brainstorming session it's not enough that you broke them up into categories now you have to actually go out and test them for validity and see if these are issues that really are going back to causing that problem so this set, uh, point which is probably the most important part I'm gonna call it the most important part because you're actually taking an action and you're using this to actually go out and, and see what all might be going on you may decide that some of these problems are no longer valid or you may actually go out and see that you've hit the, the, the nail on the head on the first couple of tries but whatever it is, you now have a very systematic way of approaching it based on these different categories and different possible causes that can all lead back to that, that problem. So let's look at an example. That's one of the best ways to get more acquainted with an, an Ishikawa diagram. So here we have a guy painting a car. So let's say that's our organization. In our organization, we actually run a, a shop that actually paints cars for our customers and you know they bring in their product they do you know some sort of body work and when they're done we paint the car and we give it back to the customer and it's supposed to look good as new but we're having customers give us complaints you're saying that the paint's too thick the paint's too tacky uh it's not being applied appropriately so we've got to try and figure out okay what's causing this problem so we come up with our miss, miss ishikawa diagram and we establish a problem statement you know so we say the problem statement is that the Paint, paint coating is too thick and too tacky. Okay, so now we have a problem that we can address. Now I broke it up into these different categories. You know, the, the typical five, man, machine, method, environment, and material. So now it's time to start brainstorming. So as we start considering, well, what could cause the paint coating to be too thick and too tacky? What could actually be going on that could cause this problem? So, you know, we have a group of people typically of different disciplines or definitely you know within the discipline 
that would have relevant knowledge on this process or various aspects of this process, particularly in the different categories, and we get their input. So we could say, okay, one might be a manpower problem. We've got too many. We're getting a lot of new employees. They don't know what they're doing yet, and they don't have enough experience. You know, so we've got these new employees. So maybe we have some training issues. Maybe we have people not assigned to the proper jobs. Another concern under the machine, you know, the actual equipment. Maybe some of our nozzles are getting too worn. You know, not sending out the paint in a, an even spray or maybe we have some issues with air regulators you know air regulators aren't calibrated properly we think we're setting them up properly but but we're obviously or possibly not you know the temperature of the shop might be too warm or too cool you know so we're not setting up the paint properly it's not curing when it should and leaving it tacky and maybe getting too thick of a coating or we don't have proper ventilation you know too much moisture is building up in the air and you know not allowing it to dry properly or some other issue maybe we've got under material we've got poor quality paint you know we're not using the best quality paint that we could have and that is you know causing it to have these issues of not drying properly or maybe you know the coating is, is coming out too thin or too thick or maybe we're doing something with this with the primer maybe there's an issue there you know so we can see they, they actually put primer all over the body of the car you know, all over the body of the car here. So maybe if this isn't right, the paint's not setting up properly. And then under the method, you know, do we have a standard procedure? It's real easy to, you know, have everybody out there just winging the job. But, you know, if they don't have a procedure to go by, then that might tie right into, you know, the manpower issue. You know, there's a training issue. So is there a, a procedure that we can actually follow that we can actually say this is a good procedure? this is actually doing what we need it to do. Maybe we actually need to go back and review that and potentially standardize it. Okay, so now now that we've done the fishbone diagram, and this was, you know, again, a very quick, very, you know, preliminary just for observation use only, you know, view of a, a, of a Ishikawa diagram, fishbone diagram, what are we going to do with the results? What are we going to do with this big fishbone? With all these possible causes and the ultimate effect of uh, having too thick and too tacky of paint. Well, now we start going into a follow-up, knowing what the problem is, and knowing that we've got the benefit of an organized, systematic approach, you know, highly visual, we can go ahead and take this information and we can start actually investigating it. You know, so once you've established, you know, the different categories and the potential causes under each one of those categories, as well as a very established problem statement, you can actually start considering, no, that's not good, you can actually start considering, you know, going out and looking at things, you know, talking to some of the employees, you know, how long have you been here? How long have you been doing this particular job? Where you train properly? You know, where you, how long have you been doing on, on this particular assignment? You know, you can start inspecting the nozzles, the spray nozzles. You know, are they, you know, the right size? Are they starting to wear out? You know, are the, are the air regulators calibrated? You know, is there a procedure in place? Somebody could go out and actually investigate this. You know, what is the ventilation system like? Is it, is it proper? Is it, are the filters in place? Are they, are they being changed routinely? What's the temperature of the room supposed to be? Is the shop supposed to be too warm? Is the, is the shop too humid? You know, is it is it too cool? Is it a lot, you know, what's the paint supposed to be set up at? Or what temperature is supposed to be set up to get the uh, proper uh, finish on the paint? And, you know, as, since we're talking about paint, what is the quality of the paint? Are we buying cheap paint? Or are we buying, you know, the, the top of the line paint that's going to be good for the job? As well as what kind of primer are we using? Is that a, the appropriate primer? Are we using it properly? So these are the things that you would use a, fish, a fishbone diagram or an Ishikawa diagram to help you understand. You know, it's not the only way to solve a problem, but it is definitely one way to be able to look at that problem and approach it in a way that's systematic as well as organized, as well as, you know, very, very, you know, very meth meth methodical so that we can actually understand you know what we're doing so we don't keep retracing our steps so that we don't end up wasting a lot of time and hopefully get to the root cause of the problem uh, a lot with a lot a lot less eventful or with, uh, without any uh, circumstances or event and be able to you know 
you know, solve the problem sooner. So again, this is Professor Cummings. If this video was helpful to you, I'll just go ahead and subscribe. I try to put out at least two videos every week. You can also go on my Facebook page under Infinity MFG and follow me on Twitter, Twitter Infinity MFG. And then there's my Google Plus page, which is a, a whole community of people looking at different problems, um, looking at different articles on manufacturing and engineering. You can look at my manufacturing, engine, manufacturing skills and education page on Google Plus, and then on the engineer's reference on Google Plus. Both of those have a lot of good information. I typically put videos there as well, um, as well as different articles that I think might be of interest. So go ahead and like and subscribe if this was helpful. Otherwise, I'll talk to you soon.